Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think we'll just get started in a second here as people are, I notice are still getting uh, coming into the call. And um, so I hope you all were able to get outside, enjoy this beautiful weather, a little bit humid, but you know what? Who's complaining, right? We've had winter and Wisconsin winters last forever, so we'll take whatever we can get here. I certainly enjoy this weather and uh, look forward to, it's supposed to be in the 70s and 80s, cloudy or not, we'll take it, right? You are on the call. Please turn your video on so we can see everyone's faces. Thank you very much. And I need to, I guess you should have asked me to share my screen a long time ago, right? All right, I have to now, give me one second because now I have to open this up. There we go. And we're going to move you over here. Give me one second. I'm going to, I guess, got to open up my slide here. All right, here we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, we're good. All right, super. All right, so, all right, welcome once again. I'm sure everybody's on the call by now. If not, I know Samantha will let people in as, as we get going here. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, here's what I would like for you to do, please. Last week, you had an opportunity to break up into groups, um, depending on your interest and whether you did funding with myself or you were with uh, Samantha with the report card um, session, if you can please take your name, rename it, like mine says F Pascual, <laughs> sounds funny, but if you can do that, um, do that with your name, please. So we know who's who and when Samantha's putting everyone into the groups, she knows what groups to put you in because you will break out in a few minutes with your group. For those of you that are on the call that were not with us last week, there was an assignment that was given. People would, were asked to meet throughout the week from Wednesday up until today somewhere, depending on the group that they're in. If you were not on the call, I'm just still gonna ask you to please put an F or an R by your name and you'll be included in that group. They may have already um, began some process of, of the assignment. So you may just um, either just be a listener or, or ask if, if there's anything that you can do to contribute to the um, exercise that we're going to be doing um, in a few minutes as we have uh, two guests with us, uh, Spencer and Kalesen should be on this call, who will be the ones that will you will be asking your uh, questions based on your research project that you were asked to uh, um, do last week. So if you have not done though, please make sure that you rename yourself so Samantha knows where to put you in the groups. As always, we go through this session norms, um, safety to share different perspectives, equity and voice, active and attentive listening, commitment to work. You all have been very good at that, especially when we break out into sessions. I appreciate your, your willingness to contribute to the exercises and certainly hope that you were doing so up until this point um, with your groups that you were with uh, assigned to. Um, mindful using technology, you all are, know what that means. Make sure you stay on mute unless you um, have a question. Please unmute yourself and just interrupt me and interject as you need. If you'd rather do the chat, you can do that and Samantha will monitor the chat as well. All right. Today's session, again, we did the welcome, the recap, and we'll do the overview and then we'll break out into quick groups um, as I stated. Then we're going to get into our research actions with, with our guest speakers that are with us. And then we're going to break. Our guest speakers will log off. They're gone for the night. Uh, and then we'll continue with what we need to do with regards to types of actions and things of that nature that we're going to do. We'll probably watch a small video, a real short video, which is exactly what we're, you're training on what you need to do. And um, it's from the um, Innovate School System. Uh, it's about five minutes long. It's really interested. So please make sure you have a pen and paper ready so you can take some notes because then we'll do a debrief and ask you some questions or ask you if you have any questions regarding the video. Um, so it's kind of interesting and it's exactly what you are here in training and prepared to do after we get done. So we are on the eve of your graduation, right? This is the Wednesday before the last Wednesday. So, you know, that's always a good thing, right? So that's going to be our, 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 our agenda for today. And as always, we'll end it up with a, with a survey. And then our, save is, our survey is going to take just a little longer today. No, that's next week. Sorry, forget it. Scratch that. I'm jumping the gun here. 
Um, you'll do the survey and then the three questions that we ask, what did I learn, you know, what do I know now, so forth and so on, all right? So today, as I mentioned, we'll do research action with expert. Um, has Kalesen on the call yet? Not yet? All right, so we'll just, we'll, we'll then we'll, we'll, I don't know who's first. I'm not sure if it's um, Kalesen or, or Spencer, um, and, but we'll, let, we'll um, invite Spencer to go first and, and then we'll get um, Kalesen. If not, between the three of us, we can probably handle the, the funding part of it, depending on your questions, all right? So we'll do that and then we'll go into funding and accountability and things of that nature that we've kind of discussed already. Again, we're, can you believe it? We're in the fifth week how time flies, right? We were started off with conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations, now we're in session five. Um, so last week we spent a good, almost two hours talking about, um, you know, session, uh, our last um, program, which was public speaking, right? You were all asked to do some little um, public speaking and what that meant and how you can improve on your public speaking, what it is, how do you prepare for that? We talked about Oh, I'm not going to do that because I want you to do that for me, um, for us, I should say. And then um, what are some of those key takeaways from session four? So if you don't mind unmuting yourself and someone, if you want to volunteer and come out, what did you learn? What were the takeaways from session four last week? I always like to recap. Um, this is Sandra Storga. Uh, we did a practice on how to organize a research action group, and um, that was a good practice. Uh, we learned a lot about organize, identify, um, and do an agenda, and many other things that you give us an idea what we have to do for uh, preparing in order to have a research action group. Super, always gotta do that research before we wanna meet with anyone, right? We just don't wanna just go meet with somebody without knowing a little bit about them. You wanna do your research on the person that you're gonna be um, meeting with, whether it be a principal, whether it be an administrator, whether it be a politician, someone from the legislative department, doesn't matter. Always wanna have your research done a little bit. Again, you don't have to know everything about the person, but enough so you can have a meaningful conversation. Anything else, what have we learned? Um, the desegregation and race equity and inclusion um, was an interesting piece to me. And then um, our what, who, why, and then do. Perfect. Yes. Uh, we, we, I think we talked about this, the little desegregation of the school system and how that, the history of that. And we um, had a little bit of information on there. So thank you. Uh, anyone else? There was a couple of things that we talked about. Let's see if we can get it. Uh, well, when we broke into our groups, we learned a lot about funding and how funding is not equally distributed amongst MPS, voucher schools, charter schools, and that was an eye-opener for most of us, I think. Um, so that's kind of what we, that's what we did our research on, and we're still very surprised. Super. Great. That, and then there was one more. Who wants to talk about the other one that we talked about, or someone else talked about? <laughs> Let's see how good a job Samantha did. There was one more breakout group. Which one was it? It was report cards. Thank you. <laughs> and we were learning about how not as every percentage that is shown on the report cards doesn't necessarily reflect the full process of the school. That's correct. Yes. So a lot of it is very general information and that you get on the face of the report card. But then as a previous administrator, I can tell you there's more than one page to that report card and it really breaks down um, proficiencies, demographics, special ed, ESL, and how those uh, um, different students in those categories are performing. And so <laughs> race and ethnicity, uh, all that is factored in. So you can really break it down um, to, to the individual and to the cohorts of individuals. As for funding, as stated, yes, you, you we talked about having 10 students in one block or nine students. I, I broke it down by nine, if I can recall. Three go to private, three go to charter, and three go to MPS. 
yet the funding sources and the value that's put on every one of those child is much different. And, and you have to ask yourself, how is that possible that one child's educational value is four, five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 less than the educational value of another child that lives in the same block in the same community, right? So we talked about those disparities there, inequities that exist there. So thank you very much. And as you can see, um, we didn't get into oral testimony, but we, um, or, um, Sandra did a little bit about how you do your oral testimony. And that comes out of your written testimony, right? You're going to do the written testimony first because that's where you get your practice. You'll write out your thoughts, you articulate it very well, and then you come out and you give your oral testimony. Again, you know, most of this is now done virtually, but eventually as we get back into whatever we can call normal, um, depending on where you're going, what your, what your message is, whether it be at a school board meeting or at a legislative um, um, uh, meeting, you can actually speak and, and use your voice to express your concern or support for a particular item. And you do that based on that written testimony that you did, right? As you can then we did the research action group, which we just talked about the two. We did funding. We just chose funding and report cards. So good job of, of summarizing those areas um, because those are uh, key factors in, in our educational system. So by the end of this session, all right, we will have practice our public speaking skills. Your homework was to go from Wednesday, last Wednesday at 8 p.m. up until today to meet sometime if you can with your group and get prepared to have that research action group and the questions you're going to present or ask to the, um, um, the, the so, uh, experts that are online, which uh, Spencer is one of them. He'll introduce himself in a minute and hopefully we'll have Colestin on the call soon. If not, uh, myself and Samantha, or, and, and for that matter, Spencer can, can um, interject in that one as well. Again, okay. I'm here, I apologize. No, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Colestin <laughs> is with us, hallelujah. All right, super. So he'll, he'll introduce himself in a minute, <clears throat> gain more information about the Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee schools, right? We talked about that. Um, funding and report card, that's exactly what those two um, specialists are here for, those experts that we help learn about different types of actions, right? The, we will see we're three different types of actions that we're going to learn today. All right. So right now, you should have, um, if, you did, if you didn't hear me in the beginning, you should have changed your name and put an F next to your name or a um, R. F is for funding, R is for report cards, and Samantha is going to now break you out. So you'll have 10 minutes. Right now it's 6.13, let's say around 6.15, till about 6.25 to meet with your group. Um, if, you, if, if you were able to meet, <clears throat> this is basically just giving you an, um, an opportunity to come together one last time before we get our experts on board and they introduce themselves. And then you take it from there, and then you introduce yourself based on the assignment that was given to you all on Wednesday. So, Samantha, if you can break them out. Any questions real quick? Anyone have questions? Again, we're just breaking you into 10 for 10 minutes so you can kind of um, gather your thoughts with your, with your teammates and get ready to, uh, to, to present to or ask those questions to Kalesin or Spencer. All right? If no one, no questions, then Samantha... If you can just break them out, that'd be great. Thank you. First need to do to improve. <laughs> so you know, they're last in offense in the MLB. They just need Yelly back, right? They just got him back, but he's not, you know, who knows? Welcome back, everyone. Everyone back yet, Samantha? I'm assuming, yes, maybe so. Yep. Yeah. All righty. Welcome oh, back. Awesome. Well, we hope you had some time to um, gather your thoughts and uh, prepared to... Um, to do what we're going to do next, and that is speaking with our experts here. So, so here is what we're going to do, um, introduction of speakers. So I'm going to invite them. I'm going to invite Spencer and Colestin to introduce themselves. They're colleagues of both myself and Samantha. We all work for City Ford Collect, uh, Collective, and so, but I'm going to invite at the, at the time, at this time, Spencer, if you don't mind introducing yourself and what do you do for the organization, and then when he's done, Colestin, if you can just hop in, thank you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. My name is Spencer Sheen, and I'm manager of data and impact here at City Forward Collective. So my role does a lot of work with the report cards. So every year when the report card comes out, I'm doing a lot of analysis on the data. And I also lead um, training sessions that we put on for school staff and school leaders here. So through all of that work, I've had to become 
intimately um, familiar with the whole report card process and what goes into every score. Uh, so that's why I'm our resident expert here tonight. Thank you, Spencer. Kalestin? Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm sorry I was a couple minutes late. Kalestin Morgan, I am our Director of Policy and Advocacy. Um, maybe probably first and most important, I am also a parent, uh, just like you. I've got a, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old who may pop in here along the way. Um, in terms of my professional responsibilities, however, I lead a lot of our, our policy research and, and, and analysis work, I, a lot of our, our efforts at the state legislature, uh, and a lot of our monitoring efforts, you know, in particular around funds, in particular in the, in the last year, uh, as there's been a, a lot of sort of one-time funding and, and special supports for, for schools uh, during the, the COVID pandemic. But um, it, Prior to this role, I, I also was for a number of years a, a district administrator in New Orleans. So, from lots of different perspectives, had um, uh, had have some have some some lived experience and and some academic experience uh, around around public funding issues. I'm excited to be here for you all tonight. Thank you. So, as you can see, they both have a different set of skill sets that are aligned to what you are going to be doing today. Uh, both myself and Samantha, we kind of skimmed the top last week, although I've worked in that capacity in funding and had to deal with report cards. Um, probably not to the extent and to the degree that, that the two individuals that are on the call uh, can share. So, uh, so we're going to start off with Spencer So um, in report cards. And basically what it is, is you're going to have 20 minutes. So we'll keep track of time. Um, you'll do intros. Um, you were um, instructed to do, um, someone can do an intro, um, some testimonials, uh, questions uh, for the speaker. And if time allows, if there's members from the fund uh, group that have questions for the report card group, we can do that as well and vice versa when Kalestin comes on and does, uh, and, and is here's, here's the fund department uh, or group speak those individuals from the report can, can ask questions, um, clarifying questions if you have those. So hope you have a pen and paper ready to maybe write, jot down some information that you're going to learn today. And so on that note, I'm going to ask that Spencer and uh, the report card group, whomever that is, um, kick us off and take it from there. We have 20 minutes, so it's 6.30. So around 6.50, we'll start to transition or 6.45-ish, we'll start to transition out of that and into the funding. So whoever's in charge or whoever's in charge of uh, the report cards, that group, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Spencer, for being here tonight. Uh, we are the group uh, that is interesting um, to hear more about school report cards. Uh, we are a group of parents uh, that want to be involved in our children's education and have a strong representation in our community to educate other parents. This time, we're here to learn about report cards and if there is any connection related with the school funding. My name is Sandra Storga. I'm a full-time working mom of uh, graduating eighth grade from a charter school and graduate senior from a private high school. So am I answering that question or? No, oh. <laughs> no, we're, Sorry, we're, we're, we're trying to present our group. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I, I, I didn't know I was muted. Uh, hello, my name is Montrese Goss. I'm a wife, a mother of two. Um, a ninth and a fifth grader, public charter is one and public is the other. Hi. Hi, my name is Alma and I am a mother of three students uh, who are currently um, attending up to a private school is a third grader, uh, K-5 and sixth grade. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's pretty much it <laughs> about me. Hi, my name is Kayla Robinson Escudero. I am currently 20 weeks pregnant. And as of today, I have a nine-year-old in third grade that goes to a choice school. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Humphrey-Mills and I am 
a mother of five adults who graduated from MPS and charter and private, so all three spectrums, and I'm a grandmother of 16. Yes, so wow. I need to know some things. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Sandra? It's Sandra and Nicole. Okay, we're gonna introduce our right, topic. I'm trying to unmute okay. myself. Hi, I'm Sandra. I'm a mother of three kids that are in school. I got one graduating high school this year and I got one graduating eighth grade this year. And I got a new one that's in K-4 this year. So I need to know a lot about report cards and how it works for those different grades. Thank you, Sandra. So uh, they, we are, again, a school report card group. So Kayla. Um, so for our introduction, we just want to go over a little bit of what we are reporting. So as part of the state accountability system, the Department of Public Instructions, DPI, produces report cards for every public funded school and district in Wisconsin. These accountability report cards include data on multiple indicators for multiple years across priority areas, student achievement, growth, closing gap, and on-track and post-secondary success. In addition, given the impact on the student success, the accountability report cards also measure chronic absenteeism and dropout rates. In November, in 2019 and 2020 report cards was not created due to COVID. Okay. Can I go now? Were you done, Kayla? Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm yes. just, I'm, again, I'm a tree sauce and I'm giving the history of the report cards. Um, the report card is an effort that was placed on behalf of the ESEA, which is Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Uh, it began back in December 10th of 2015. It then was formerly known as the No Child Left Behind Law and later changed to the Every Student Succeed Act, which is known as ESSA. Um, it was formed as a means of measuring federal requirements for schools in need of improvement. Um, they have formed a district as well as the individual school report cards um, as a means of being accountable federally and state levels. Um, so the information they receive derives from a various amount of activity and data included would be student achievement, growth, on track and post-secondary, and also a fifth area known as closing the gaps. It was originally titled, excuse me, closing the gaps, and now it's been changed to target group outcome. Um, the record, report card also measures the chronic absenteeism and dropout rates. The categories significantly exceed expectation, exceeds expectation, meets few expectations, uh, fails to meet expectations, and the percentages go from one, well, they don't measure up to 100, but roughly around 100 and on down the weaker the grades are, just like a normal report card. Um, one more thing. So the target group was created and revamped as a priority area to make measures more reliable, inclusive, and action uh, based on actions. And that's it. And it included all types of schools, all types of kids, um, cultural. They, they were very inclusive when they made up this report card. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. How you see, we did our homework and uh, research before coming to you and get some um, answers to our questions. Uh, before that, we have two testimonies. Um, the obviously, testimonies that will help to uh, learn more about our concerns. So Alma. Um, hi, um, again, my name is Alma. And then um, I just wanna share uh, what happened to me um, with my, uh, in my oldest daughter's school. Um, usually um, in the past, they have sent us um, information, reminders um, to let parents know about um, 
the state test. And this time, um, a couple, couple of weeks ago, I will say like um, last month, uh, we, did, I was, we were receiving reminders, emails, um, notification, notifications in class dojo about the state test. But now this time, um, the teacher was um, actually sending um, constantly reminders um, to let us, to let parents know and to ask parents to help students to, um, especially in math, which it was the math, math um, instructor, the teacher um, to help them out. And it was a little bit overwhelming because it was, um, she um, divided um, 25 questions over the weekend. It was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And she was um, like a little, um, I will say, um, you know, like telling the students, we, we need to do this, we need to do that. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that um, you go through this over the weekend with your parents. And I know um, it, this school year was hard because of COVID and I'm not sure if it was because they didn't have enough time to go through all the material or if it was because they were, it, it was virtual and then they um, didn't have, like if she wasn't sure that, you know, they didn't have enough time to work over the, um, I know math is a hard subject and then, but it was just a little too much. Um, so this is something that happens to me and my family. And then um, we will find out in one of the questions later, um, something that is related with, the, with my testimonial. So basically a testimony of uh, frustration where we are related to taste, um, to a state test uh, that our kids are doing and obviously how is the stress in the schools about the results. Um, I have a different um, testimony too. I'm looking for a high school for my daughter. I decided to check the DPI school report. And honestly, it was very difficult and confusing a private high school with a strong reputation in my community is for 69.2. And I really love the strong program that they have, which is in a different area, but they have 69.2. Ronald Reagan, we know that is well-recognized as academic school and they have 82.3. However, I'm concerned about the difference when you see a 90.4 in a homestead in Meguan. So 69.2 is Crystal Ray, Milwaukee. 82.3 is Rona Regan. 91.4 is Homestead. This stressed me and confused me a lot. I wish there were more tools to understand this difference at the parent level, taking into account the many more other situations are generating this rating. So um, Spencer, we have, um, few questions for you and obviously you're the expert and we want to learn more about the school report cards. Montres? Okay, so the first question is, what is the reasoning for the change of closing the gap to target group outcome? It kind of was explained in my introduction or of the history, but it's, can you give us more detail? Yeah, and first I want to commend all of you because, as I said, I've spent a lot of time digging into all of this and it's taken me, you know, years to get up to speed on everything and you all have a pretty firm grasp over, what, a week of digging into this, so that's, uh, it's not an easy process to wrap your hands around, so uh, kudos to you for that. Uh, the closing gap score was has been problematic for years, um, mainly because it is tied specifically to the student groups. So it assumes that the worst performing students in a school will be the disadvantaged categories. So that would be the racial or ethnic categories that are not white, uh, the students who are economically disadvantaged and students with disabilities, English language learners. So by default, it is assuming that those students are doing worse than the state average. So if you have a school where those students are doing better, 
then it can completely throw off the, the score because of that. And also there are problems with the student groups um, just within a school because a school might only have a few students, a few Hispanic students, for instance, or a few black students, and that could change from year to year, which makes it really difficult to track those groups across the years. So one year the school might have data and the next year the school might have data. And so what this can lead to is a school could have uh, these subgroups. Uh, for instance, I know of a school that's almost 100% Hispanic students scoring above the state average uh, on their achievement score, but their score was flat. So it wasn't changing compared to the statewide average where the state average was slightly increasing every year. So even though this school was, their students were testing better than the state average, the, they were scored poorly in this area. And it all really relates to how it's tied to these specific student groups. So the reason they're, oh, and finally last year, the closing gap or 2018-19, the last report card we had, um, the schools saw huge fluctuations in their scores. So from the previous year, their closing gap score could have fluctuated by 10 points. And you can tell 10 points on a 100 point scale is pretty drastic. So they said, again, this is because those student groups are changing from year to year. And it's not reflecting that, oh, this school is teaching these students better. It's just because the makeup of the student body is changing. So for all of those reasons, they decided they needed to revamp this score uh, and they decided to come up with the target group outcomes, like you said. And so the target group outcomes is described as kind of a mini report card. So it's much more comprehensive. So it'll avoid some of those shortcomings, but also it's, not, it's no longer tied to the student group. It's not tied to the race of the students. It's not tied to the economic status or any of that. Instead, it's just looking at the lowest 25% of students and seeing how well those students are doing. So every school, every year is gonna have a bottom 25% of students. So those problems aren't gonna come into play like they did with the closing gap score. Thank you. And Thank then you. another question would be, do children have specific time to prepare for the state test? And what are the procedures? Uh, that is a classroom type procedure that I am not as well versed on. I don't know, Pasquale, you could probably answer this one better than me. I, I, I can. Yes. Thank you. Um, given I did this for <laughs> yeah. 20 years. Uh, so you typically, the, the state will, will give the dates of the test and they will provide a window of, of, of opportunities for students to take kind of like a practice test, not the actual test itself, but a mock test of that test, if that makes any sense. So the kids can actually go online and do some, 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 some um, pre-test, we, we call it just in preparation for the actual test itself. So teachers have these uh, capabilities in their classrooms um, from within maybe a month or two before the actual exam. But that doesn't mean that throughout the year, teachers cannot, because they know what's already going to be on the test for some, for, to some degree, that they don't teach kids test strategies, right? That's what I think teachers in the classroom really do from the beginning especially when it comes to, like in our school, everything was done computerized. The computer teacher will actually go through um, test practices on how you use a mouse, how do you use a keypad, how do you highlight, how do you, things that the test is asking, you know, how, you, how do you um, identify or, 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 or have a, um, a passage that you need to highlight in a reading test, things of that nature. So there's constant things that the teachers can do within the classroom that will help a student when they come to actually take the test, prepare them for that because they're in some cases timed, in some cases, I don't know if it's changed now, but nonetheless, uh, there are uh, things that teachers can do. And then there's obviously companies out there that provide services or even their product 
that the teachers can use or principals can purchase that will allow um, schools to kind of practice um, what this forward exam is going to look like, even though it's not the forward exam, but it kind of mimics the forward exam. So the key there is you're not, the kids are not entering into a test session with something that's foreign to them. It's going to be um, something that they've seen already in the past, especially with your third graders, because that's the first year kids actually test is in third grade. So a lot of that is done prior to. As the kids get older, they probably have recognized the test already, so they're familiar with it. But that was a long answer to a question about can there, are there things that can be done prior to the test? The answer is yes. Uh, schools typically have an opportunity to do some practice um, testing with their kids and uh, not to mention all the other things that the school can do to prepare the kids for that actual um, time when, when the testing um, window opens. Yeah, and one thing I would add to that is this year um, being a year of virtual schooling and the pandemic, uh, there was a little uncertainty about whether testing would happen in the spring. And I know school, certain schools were pushing back and maybe thinking that testing wouldn't happen but in the end, it obviously did come down that the state is requiring tests. So all that's to say it could, it's probably varies school by school, but I could very well see that certain schools were not as prepared as they might be in normal years. Yeah, I don't think this year schools are probably going to use this school as a benchmark because there's so much uncertainty with it. Um, and so who knows what's going to happen down the road, but. Yeah, to, to uh, Spencer's point, um, there was a lot of pushback from schools because of the virtual aspect of it. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how much is the funding effective, affected by report cards? Uh, it actually is not affected by the report cards. There is a law that Coleston will maybe speak to better than me in his part, but uh, if a school fails in their report card I multiple years in a row, then there's the possibility that the school will uh, close, but we've never seen that happen in Milwaukee, and that's the only action that can be taken based on the results of report card scores. Otherwise, um, every publicly funded student is required to be tested. Every school that receives public dollars is required to have a report card and make it publicly available. And so I think the thinking is that uh, parents will see how the school is doing on their scores and then will enroll their students or their children accordingly. And by that, that will be the accountability for the school, but there isn't a, a mechanism written into the funding that will reduce funding if schools are performing worse. And I think someone mentioned earlier, uh, or no, that was an aside, never mind. Colestin, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to add briefly that there are a, a couple of small pots of money that are additional money that schools that perform at lower levels have access to if the state designates them as schools that are in need of targeted or comprehensive support that's required by federal law. But it's a relatively small amount of money. And, 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 and as Spencer said, until a school gets to sort of the theoretical point where they've had a, low, a poor score for enough years that, that closure is on the table, there aren't any sanctions based on performance. No school is punished for poor performance by losing dollars. The only, the only thing I would add is, uh, is enrollment, right? Every child comes with a dollar value. And if your, your school is performing low, then to Spencer's point, you can choose whether you want to send your child there. And if you pull your child out, that school just lost whatever dollar value that school is receiving. So that's kind of a self-imposed penalty, I guess you can say, for schools that are not performing well, is when you pull your child out, you take that money and it go to another school. Now that school benefits from that child's, um, unless they replace that student. But so, you know, it behooves schools to have a good report card because it's going to be attractive to parents when they're selecting schools and those that have poor scores and who have active and like I like to call this um, um, engaged parents and you know, consumerly, consumer engaged parents when it comes to selecting schools, you're gonna look at that report card. And if you don't like what you see, 
then you're going to choose somewhere else. And that's dollars that are that school is missing for every child that chooses not to go to that school. All right. Thank you. Quick, quick question. Yes, quick question. Quick, quick. Okay. It, okay. What I wanted to know was, even though they were talking about report cards, is the testing, um, if they don't test their kids, do they lose funding? No. There used to be a requirement that schools had to have a certain percentage of their students tested, but that went away, I think, in 2015 with the new report card laws, and now uh, they're just required to put on their report card what percentage of their students are tested, but there's no punishment for having a low percent of students tested. All right. I'd be interested in seeing how many virtual students were able to be tested as to the in-person because we had a hard time. It was like, almost like get a artillery. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I can't wait to see the, how the gap, there's going to be a big gap there. Yeah, when the data comes out in the fall about mm -hmm. school year, we're all waiting to see what it looks like. Oh, it's going to be crazy. And that's why I'm saying schools may not use this as a benchmark because it's, it's I don't think it's valid, valid in, um, 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 data that you're going to use um, down the road. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for our um, our report card group. Great job in your presentation and your research and, and the information. As Spencer said, he spent years um, preparing for what he needs to do. And you did this in seven days or six days for that matter. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Great questions, great intro, um, and so we appreciate your uh, your your willingness to put forth the effort throughout the week in, in coming to the uh, to this uh, research presentation. So, on that note, we're going to transition. Thank you, uh, Spencer. We're going to um, transition to funding. So, whomever is going to kick that one off, I invite you to do so at this moment. Thank you. Make sure you unmute yourself. Go ahead, Laura. I'm sorry. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for meeting with us today. We greatly appreciate your time and assistance. My name is Laura, and I have four children. I have one in a 16-year-old in Ronald Reagan High School, and the other two are in Notre Dame School of Milwaukee. Uh, it's a, I think it's a choice school, private. And my other daughter, she's going to start this year um, at the same school of my other two little ones. And um, we did some research over the weekend. My team members are Jennifer, Sandra, and Anna. Um, we researched for about the fundings of MPS and private schools. We want to share the information that we found and hopefully you can help us answer some of our questions. We will, be, we will begin with a couple of testimonials from Jennifer and Sandra. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Um, I have two kids that are both in the Choice Program at Blessed Sacrament. My son is in K-4 and my daughter is in fourth grade. Um, I did some research on the elementary level of the funding that goes or where kind of the funding is being spread out um, with the private versus the public schools. I just went with my school. I looked into a couple different ones, but I'm going with uh, Blessed Sacrament as the private school and Fairview, which is nearby as the public school. Um, I went kind of based off of the report cards as well, but I looked, I'm gonna try to steer more towards the um, extracurriculars and things like that that they offer versus, um, or well not versus, but also including the enrollment in each. Blessed Sacrament only has um, an enrollment, well, as of 2018, 2019, of about 174 students. They only have 12 teachers. Uh, I'm not sure how many teachers total Fairview had, but there was a great number of uh, faculty staff, a lot more than Blessed Sacrament, and their 
enrollment was 673. They're both K through eight. And the, the huge amount of differences that I noticed just with the extracurriculars, I, both of my kids play soccer, um, which is one of the few that Blessed Sacrament offers sports-wise. Um, outside of that, their music program, they only have choir. Um, I think at one point they were offering some piano lessons after fifth grade. Um, the sports that they offer, basketball, dance, football, soccer, and volleyball, but half of those are only for upper level, fifth and up. Fairview, they offer cheer, volleyball, track, basketball, football, soccer, as well as numerous clubs. They've got theater, music theater, band, orchestra, um, you know, after school tutoring. And I feel I, my daughter has expressed interest in the past in, in playing instruments. She would love to learn how, but she's not even offered that opportunity. And I think that has a lot to do with the funding. Um, the, the choice program only offers about 8,300 per student. And granted that has to do with COVID as well. They've gotten some extra funding um, from COVID, but the public schools are offering over 14,000 per student. And I feel like it, there's just a huge disparity and it's, it's not fair. I feel like my daughter and son both have done exceptionally well in school and have dedicated themselves and performed on tests and everything and they deserve a chance to have some of these extra advantages and extra fun things to do that the public schools are offering that they're not. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. I am going to pass it off to Sandra. So she's going to go over the high school aspect of it. And that's my testimony. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Navarrete. I'm currently a mother of four children. Um, my three oldest kids are the ones who are currently in school. My youngest is a four-year-old who's going to be starting K-4 next school year. Um, and the three that attend school are in the private sector. They go to St. Augustine Preparatory Academy. Um, I, so, for the sake of this presentation, I did research in information at the high school level uh, for my two older boys. My oldest is in ninth grade. My second one is a seventh grader. And my third child in school is a sixth grade. So I did the inequalities that I found um, regarding driver's education and vocational technical programs for high schools. Um, for what I was able to find, I focused only on one public school, which was Pulaski, which is the nearest and in the neighborhood for where we live. Um, one of the requirements for driver's education at Pulaski was that the student had to be obviously an MPS. And the age requirement was that the student is at least 15 and a half years old upon registering and no older than 17 and a half by the end of the last class. That's how you know. <laughs> the registration is uh, available obviously online and it opened up on April 27th. The fee for an MPS student to register for driver's ed is only $35, which it covers the permit. And there is a slogan saying that MPS is uh, MPS drive is free for any MPS students, which means they only charge the $35 fee for an MPS student and everything else is free of charge. Now, if I were to enroll my son who, into a, a program for driver's ed, he is required to pay $150 because he is a Milwaukee resident. Had we lived outside of Milwaukee, then he, was, he would have to pay the $275 fee to register. So this actually came as a shocker um, because as we're talking and researching about funding, I realized, okay, so one, private schools do not have the ability to have a driver's education program within the school. So we have to resort to an outside facility, in this case would be an MPS. MPS offers it to their students, gives them priority 
and waives most of the fees. From us learning about the for the gap between a student receiving over 14 grand in MPS and a private student enrolled receives over 8,000, obviously, I can understand that most of that can also cover part of the education, uh, driver's education program. So there's like a huge gap in that. And I think that obviously as a parent, that's <laughs> concerning to me. Um, but the driver's education program is offered. The instruction is the same. They receive 30 hours of instruction. They receive the six hours of observation and the six hours of driving lessons. However, the only difference is the fees that each student has to pay. Um, so that was a big concern. The other one is the vocational and technical programs. Obviously, a private school does not have vocational technical programs. In researching, again, the differences of these programs from an MPS, which is Pulaski, and a private at Augustine Prep, um, MPS offered at least well, Pulaski offered at least five different hands-on uh, vocational technical programs. Um, they offer in the areas of transportation, distribution, autom automotive, logistics, and a youth apprentice program. In private sectors and odd prep, they really don't have any hands-on vocational technical programs. The only closest we were able to find regarding hands-on uh, experiences are the theater productions that they provide. So in theater, um, it's not really a vocational technical, it's more in the arts program and it only has acting, set design, sound and lightning, prop design, uh, stage and makeup and wardrobe. So it's still very different, um, just like Jennifer and adding to what Jennifer was stating earlier. It seems like public schools have a lot more programs to offer students, um, which I can understand they receive more funding than private, but why should there be such a huge gap difference when they receive funding? And um, that is all I have regarding my personal testimony. Um, hi, my name is Ana Manriquez. I have three daughters uh, right now, they all go to charter schools. One uh, goes to Augustine Prep and then the other two go to St. Anthony. Um, I've never actually experienced the MPS uh, program other than when I attended MPS. Uh, my daughters have always been on charter schools uh, so far. Um, we do, however, based on the information that we were able to obtain from the last presentation, from the urban Milwaukee, uh, and then all the personal experiences. And, and as far as Jennifer and Sandra went into um, the research and saw the differences between MPS and um, charter or voucher schools, we wanted to see if you could possibly answer some of the questions that we have. Um, we understand that the funding comes the funding is uh, by sector on, from the information that was shared from the urban Milwaukee. Um, it's evident that there's a difference on the funds um, and we wanted to know how the decision ma was made to actually have a, that difference in funding. We do understand that some of the differences because NPS is also, um, some of the money comes from property taxes but um, who made that decision? We wanted to see if you could answer that question for, for, for us. And is there a way to change this or what would it take to have the funds more evenly distributed, Mr. Morgan? Uh, great question. Thank, thanks everyone. Um, it, it's great to be with you and, and thank you for, for sharing your experiences. Um, the, the short answer is most of these decisions rest at the state level and with the state legislature. However, um, funding in education is a little bit more complex than just a simple answer. For public schools, 
and charter schools, funds come from three different sources. There's some federal dollars um, that schools receive, some dollars that are received from the state, and some dollars that are generated locally, primarily through property taxes. Um, the federal dollars, those are controlled out of Washington, D.C. Um, the rules for that are set at the, at the federal level by Congress and, and the president through, through their process. For our private school voucher programs, they receive very few federal dollars directly. There are some services that the district has to provide for those students, but most they don't receive any dollars directly from the federal government. Everybody receives money from the state and the state legislature sets sort of three different numbers. They set a funding level for the voucher program. They just directly write that into the, into the state budget. They set a funding level for charter schools. Again, they just write that directly in the state budget. Uh, and then for local districts, they set something called the revenue limit, which is the combination of money from the state and money from the local property tax that a local school district is allowed to raise. There's all sorts of complexity in, 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 in how that gets done, but the, the sort of bottom line answer to the question you asked is that the number that is set for private schools is lower, 80, 82, 8,300 to, to, to 8,900, I believe, um, than the number for charter schools. That's about 91 or 9,200 for charter schools. Both of those numbers, of course, are well below the amount that is set for for public school districts in Milwaukee, it's closer to 12 or 13. I know you mentioned 14 before. The last piece I'll say here is that local school districts have the ability to go to voters and ask for referendum to exceed those proper, those revenue limits that are set by the state. That happened here in Milwaukee a couple of years ago. Uh, MPS was granted a ability by the voters to exceed its revenue limits. And so this year they're raising an additional $77 million that will go to $87 million over the next couple of years. That's money that MPS raises for itself that it uses for itself. It doesn't share that money with charter schools and it doesn't share that money with private schools. It doesn't have to share that money. So the, that, that, that is one additional source of revenue that's available to district schools that isn't available to the other two. Who makes the decision of what's available and what's not available? The, 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 the legislature is sort of the first place where, where this happens um, in the budget. Uh, that process is actually going on as we speak. Um, so every two years, our legislature adopts a budget for two years. Um, as a part of that budget, they set a revenue limit. Um, as a part of that budget, they set the funding levels for charter schools and, and, and private schools. Um, like I said, the, the the local district also has taxing authority, but those dollars don't make it to charter or, or private schools. Is there anything that parents or schools can do to have the funds even more evenly distributed, or there's really, or do they need to talk to their legislator? Um, is there anything that can be done to actually just sort of make a difference on that funding aspect of the schools? You're, you you said it in your question. Talk to your legislators. Talk, they they are the people who are, who are making these decisions. And, and I would say two things. Talk to your legislators. They set the funding levels, the revenue limit for, for districts, and the actual per pupil funding levels for charter and, and, and voucher or choice school programs. The other place to show is talk to your school board members. They set the local tax rates. They also decide who gets those local taxes. Okay, thank you. Uh, that does answer most of the questions. I don't know if anyone else, Jennifer, Sandra, or Laura, do you guys have any additional questions in that scope? Um, a little bit. Um, I know that m the funding for the choice program comes from the state level. My school, Blessed Sacrament, I was very interested to see that the choice enrollment there 96% of their students are part of the choice program, which means that they're not getting the, any kind of extra, well, 4% from private enrollment, from tuition. Is there something, I guess, I'm not even sure how to word that one. Is there nothing that can be done there because it's still state? It's still coming from the state. Yeah, it, it, I, 
so you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, one thing I would say is most of the schools that participate in the choice program are like Blessed Sacrament, 80, 90, 95 percent, and in some cases, 100 percent of students are, are receiving um, uh, choice program scholarships or, or vouchers. Um, so, you know, for most of our choice schools, most of their students, almost all of their students are, are, are in this situation. Um, the, the answer really, you know, for, for the choice program, it is, it is clearer than for the other two programs. The, the state is the venue. The, the, the state sets every year, here's how much we're going to pay for vouchers in, for students in Milwaukee. Um, there are other voucher programs for students outside of Milwaukee and Racine and across the state and for students who are, who are receiving uh, special needs scholarships, students who, who, who have um, disabilities. All of, that, all of that is directly done by the state um, and directly appropriated out of state funds. And then they sort of back out some of the money from districts um, after that. Uh, so, you know, it, it's really talk to your legislatures. You're, you're, they're, they're the ones making those decisions. And the, the last little question kind of goes hand in hand with the report cards. I know that you guys addressed um, like basically punishment. Can they lose funding for report cards? Have there, has there been any consideration for offering incentives if the absenteeism rate is extremely low, if they're the, you know, the percentage of students participating in the tests and the test scores are higher, things like that. Is there anything like that as an incentive for schools? Not, not a lot, um, not, not in this state. There certainly are examples in other states where, where, where there's um, paper for, pay for, for performance is generally how these types of um, things are, are structured. There, there have been a, the, the, the the school board has negotiated or in the past had negotiated this type of incentive for one school, uh, Milwaukee College Prep. You, you may have seen in the paper in the last week, there was some discussion about the school board not paying that, that incentive payment this year because students at, the, at that school and students across the state didn't take the state test. That was, that was the basis for the incentive payment. Uh, but that, that's sort of a pretty unique example in Milwaukee. Uh, and there isn't anything, at least at present, that exists at the state level uh, in, in terms of those types of incentives or, or, or paper performance. It certainly is a, it, it's an idea that exists in other places, however. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for your questions and uh, Anna as well. And thank you for the um, um, funding uh, cohort groups for your research. I apologize. Can I add one more question? I, I'm going to give you... 30, 30 seconds really quick. Oh my gosh. Okay. Mr. Morgan, can you answer this really quick? When was the last time that the amount of funds was increased at both the public, I mean, all three public, charter, and the private sectors? Yep. So in the last budget, uh, there, were, there were very small increases, about $200 a year uh, that were directed to each of the, the, the three sectors. Um, that, and like I said, that budget for this, for the next two years is being considered as we speak over the course of the next month and month and a half. Um, we think that there might be that same type of 100 or $200, really just keeping, keeping up with inflation level increase. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, thank you again to both groups for your wonderful, um, um questions and your, the process that you took and in engaging in a conversation with both uh, Spencer and, Mo and and Kalesin. So you got a little mini exercise of what that's like to do some research prior to. Now you didn't do research on Kalesin or Spencer because that's obviously I would have said that before. You always want to know who you're speaking to, but the, the, the most important thing here is, is, is the research that we've done on the topic. And I think you did a great job of, of, of really presenting a strong argument for both sides and the questions that you had. So I want to thank Kalesin and Spencer. They're going to drop off now um, as our guest uh, professional or expert uh, speakers on these topics as we uh, transition to a quick five minute break. And when we get back, we'll get proceeding with uh, the rest of our program um, as we end our closing day. So thank you very much again to Kalestin and Spencer. We'll see everybody in five minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I can see everyone back, please. Thank you.
No, they went on break. Five minute break, there we go. Thank you. Let's see who else. I can't see everybody until I scroll through. All right, we got mostly everybody. A couple of stragglers here. All right, as we um, as everyone starts to come back, we're gonna proceed so we're not running out of time here. So we go. So all right, initial reflections or reactions to the research action. So tell me. Um, how did that go? If uh, really quick, if someone from each uh, team wants to share, um, if you met throughout the week, how did that go? How did it feel? Do you feel that, and more importantly, do you feel that it prepared you for today? If anyone wants to take a stab at that. Hi. Please Just go ahead. Uh, so we did uh, have, we had a Zoom meeting, our group had a Zoom meeting, and we kind of organized what each one of us was going to research on, and uh, so we did get a really good meeting out of it, and I think that helped us be prepared for what was coming. I think that as we're commenting through text messages right now on our break, it's disappointing to know that the easiest thing would probably be to move to one of the suburbs if we wanted to just our schools to have more funding than <laughs> having to speak to one of the legislators, which is very sad. And um, with all the research, we found a lot of things are missing. And I think that instead of getting uh, like happy, we got a little bit more disappointed. Um, but anyhow, just being prepared and just having to talk to these ladies and each one of them having their own ideas really helped our presentation go uh, smoothly. I think that it it really helped me um, see what other parents think about this, the funding and that we are all in the same sort of problem. Sure, and, and let, me, let, me, let me offer you a little bit of a paradigm shift in thinking. When you say we were disappointed, I'd rather you say not disappointed, but we were energized because you want to make a difference, right? Because when you hear the, that's, and I just want you to, it's, it's a different way of thinking, right? As opposed to, we were disappointed because then lo ponemos triste, we get sad and whatever the case may be, as opposed to, you know what, it energized us and we want to do something about it. As you heard from Colestin, um, the change comes with the legislators, right? And that's where power in numbers, Ana. And you so, know what Jennifer said? If we don't tr if we don't try asking, it definitely won't ever change. Absolutely. So that that I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it with that. That's what Jennifer yeah. said. If we right. don't if we don't try asking, it's never gonna change. Got ask power numbers. Thank you. Anyone from anyone else want to share one more person as we move on? Take away highlights from this process. Again, it's the same thing. I yeah, and I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the, the school report card group. Uh, we did the same thing. We met before and definitely it helps a lot. It, we were able to assign who was going to talk. I was nervous in a few moments when I didn't hear one of my um, team players to talk. And I was like, should I jump? But no, everyone knew what it had to do. Um, it was just probably technical um, issues that we have. So it was pretty nice and meeting those ladies and talking about the topic and organizing this. It was great. And um, it came up with good information. I still don't feel happy uh, because Crystal Ray's for me, is looks like a good uh, private school with their program and the report card is pretty low compared with other schools. So I still have my thoughts on that. But yeah, I, I, I like what we're learning. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and thank you. And so so let me offer this too as well as, again, you, it's good to look at the report card, but you want to look at the school as a whole, right? N not just a number that's associated with that report card. Remember the example I gave you last week about Brusco Lupe and another school? The other school got a higher number than we did, yet proficiencies, we were much better than that other school. But if you were to look at the numbers, you would send your kids to the other school but their proficiencies were not even near Bruce Guadalupe's. That's because of the way the, the, the report card is structured. So you have to go a little bit more in depth with the school versus what you have. So I get, 
what I'm asking is many of you, what you did here was what you call a mini house meeting, right? You did it virtually and then you found out the difficulties with virtual and sometimes technical issues come up and you have to navigate through that, which brings up a good point, Sandra, is always want to have plan B, A, and you want to have plan B, and you also want to have plan C in the event that those things don't happen, you always want to have that backup, right? So that was a great test for you and you were ready to jump in and then eventually someone figured out they were they were uh, obviously muted. So, but thank you. Uh, I you got to experience a little bit of what it is to meet outside of this of this meeting here, which is what the purpose of this exercise was. And from what I understand is many of you were able to do that and you were able to experience what it is to have it, one of those little mini house meetings, gather your information. Did, you did your research because it came out very clear in what you presented to the to the to our guest um, presenters or speakers, I, I may add. And so clearly you did the research behind what you needed to do. So I appreciate that and I thank you very much. And it was a, a small sample size, but as to some of you, to your point, to Anna and to Sandra, right? These are moments where you're gonna energize yourself and say, how do I, how can I make a change? And now you got a small sample. What do you do with this information? And what at to what level do you take this? Power numbers, ladies, power numbers. All right. So you did your research action. This is where we're at. We're at the, we're, we're coming to the home stretch. Our plane is about to land, right? And so now we're going to go into collective action. All right. That's the final step as we move forward, as we go through this um, organizing process. We did the one-on-ones. We did the family leadership and group house meetings, which you had a little bit of taste of that this week. You also included the research action based on the information that you shared with us. Clearly you combined those two beautifully. And I thank you for doing that, for the efforts you put forward with them. Now we're gonna get into collective action, right? There are three types. These are the kinds, private action. We all have those. Every single one on this call has done this before. When you have private conversations, whether it be with your spouse, whether it be with a friend, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, your children, right? Mom or dad, you've had these. So you've become kind of an expert at that already because you've been doing this all your life, ever since you were a child and even into your adulthood. The private actions, these are the conversations you have. Then you have what's called the public action. And you did that kind of today. You're doing that right now when you're in a public setting, all right? And you're organizing based on some one-on-ones, some house meetings that you had. You did your research, right? And then now we're going to move into the third phase, which is the collective action. And kind of you did that today. You all brought your thoughts together to make a presentation to a public official. In this case, Spencer and Kolesten kind of stood in like if they were public officials. And some of the questions I heard is, who do we go to to make these changes? And what you got was, is your local legislators, right? These are the people that are going to make the changes. They're in control of whatever it is you have to do within your school system, whether it be levying tax dollars from the city, whether it be the report card, whether it be the money that you're getting from the state, or, or in that case, in the federal, maybe a little bit, but nonetheless, these are the things, these are the people that you are going to be talking to. The things that you did throughout the past week in preparation for today was exactly what we were talking about is coming together, right? And ready to, to present your stuff to a in, in a public action. This, in this case, you did like a house meeting, right? Not too many one-on-ones, unless some of you met individually, that's a different, but you did the house meeting, right? You gave your presentation, your research, to what you did. So, and I heard some of you say, my research and what I found out, wonderful. This is exactly what you do in anything that you're looking to make change in. That's exactly what you want to do. And then now, what do you do with that information? Do you just fold it up and put it on your dresser and do nothing with it? No, you take action. And that's what the collective action is, is you come together as a group to present your argument on what you believe is favorable or not favorable, what you like, what you don't like to those at power. And you kind of did that today in a little bit of a taste of what that's like. So thank you. And so I hope that you understand the three different ones. We're all experts at the private uh, action, right? It's called, in Spanish, we call it bochincha, right? But gossip, right? We're all good at that, right? Um, but now we want to take that to more of a, what we call a professional setting. And that's the public action that you've seen. And then the collective action, what do you do with that public action? So you do the public action. Now you're taking it to a collective action. And that's the do. I'm going now to present as you did today to with Colestin and Spencer. All right. So here are uh, what we call examples of collective 
of collective actions, right? So attending a school board meeting, you heard um, Colestin say your local school board members um, that have control over some of the things that happen within your school, or in this case, MPS, in the control they have with the, with the education within the city, right? Giving testimony before elected officials. Some of you did that today, even though they're not elected officials, but they kind of play the role of that. You kind of did that today. You gave your testimony on why you feel, in this case, report cards and whatever the case may be, should be a little bit easier to for, for parents to navigate through or funding. How, how can we make it more equitable? You made your argument to the two individuals that were with us on the call. Um, and then um, obviously voting, that's a, you know, these are examples, but voting, even though we, we, we see that as an individual act, in some cases, some people make this actually part of a mission and they go out and they make sure that people, whether, you know, arranging um, voting marches, and literally I've seen them where people march to a poll, they collect all, get all their people, they get them gather up, they do parties and they do these rallies and then they actually march to a voting poll and they all um, 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 cast their vote individually, obviously, because that's more of a private um, personal experience but you can also make it into a public one as well. All right, and then obviously, if you have not heard 2020 and all the protests and things that went on in 2020, then you were asleep in 2020 because we got a whole lot of that, a taste of that throughout the year of all the protests that took place for, for, for obvious reasons that we won't get into, but you can see how that has led to a lot of change and even discussions that still to this day are starting to take place in our government officials to make holistic changes that are for the better interest of all of us, all the uh, citizens, uh, people of this country, right? So we've seen that. So these are, again, some of the examples of this collectiveness that you can do. Um, in this case, Anna, to your point, yes. What change do you wanna make? What do you wanna see when it comes to funding? You know where you need to go to make your argument and to make your 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 opinion and your thoughts be heard and that's to your local legislators not by yourself but gathering people who share in this common thread and you'd be sh shocked how many people out there will be will follow you to that um, because it's in the best interest not only of your kids but the kids within the community all right so i want to show a quick video it's a five minute video and then um and then we'll come back and we'll discuss shortly on it but it really is uh man i'm hoping i can get to this uh you know what Samantha, I'm having trouble accessing this video. Do you have access to it? Um, let me see if I can find the link. I can. Um... So as she does that, it's a video. It's a quick video. And really what it is, is it's a small, it's um, Innovate Schools. It's exactly what you're doing today. They've been doing this for years. They've kind of mastered it. And we kind of... Um, our, our program is almost based on what they do um, in what's called Innovate Schools and how they engage families. And you'd be surprised how many families engage in that type of, uh, um, in, in that activity. So, um, all right. So, so basically, then what, obviously, we're not going to go into this because you didn't watch the video. So we're going to have to um, move on from there. Um, but I will, I will share with you the video. Please watch it. It's really kind of cool. It really kind of addresses everything that we're doing here and what you're learning what you're learning and what they're doing and the impact that that has the power in numbers and the power that parents have is unbelievable and uh, unless you recognize that and 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 realize the power in your voice and in your action as someone i don't know who it was who said it um I, jennifer whatever if we don't say something do something nothing will get done people will continue to fund the way it's going to be funded um um um, provide information on the report card the way it's being provided until people like yourselves who take action be in the best interest of children, in the best interest of your schools, in the best interest, interest of your community, of your city, of your state. This is where parent voice becomes very important. And you will see it in that quick five minute video of how things um, move forward when parents actually step up. Because remember, you are called taxpayers and most legislators politicians how do they get paid through tax dollars and they need your support and they know that if they don't have your support you can vote them in and vote them out vote her in vote her out and so that's where the power in numbers comes in and so it's through that organizing spirit that we we uh we will continue and as i move forward in my position here 
we will probably be gathering some information about how we can start creating our own network of parents. Right now, there's one called POC, Parents of Change, and that exists as we speak, but their primary concern is going to be with charter schools, period. They don't, they're not engaged in MPS or engaged in private sectors. They're more about charter, which is okay. What we like to do is because we have parents on this call that have both in charter and in public, whether it's public charter or public MPS, how do we get those people engaged and make a difference for all students? Remember, nine kids live on one block. There should be no reason why three of those kids receive 14,000 while the other six receive less than $9,000 in education. There is no reason for that other than the politics behind that, right? So in session six, we're moving forward real quick. Uh, le your leadership commitment. We talked about this a little bit at the beginning of our session, I believe in session one, about what we're going to be doing in session six. So please make sure you take a, a picture of this or I will send this PowerPoint out, but for your purposes, um, you can probably take it. What are your takeaways from this training? Next week, you will be able to share. Remember, you're writing your own personal testimonies and things of that nature. What are you taking away from this training? From cohort one, so your cohort two, from cohort one, I have probably four or five parents that are a part of that parents of change and they are actively engaged and they were able to do that because of the confidence they received through this program. And now they're a part of a larger group of parents who are really shooting forward. Kalesan mentioned that right now the government is going through its budgetary um, session and they are meeting with legislators and I'm a part of those that I meet with them to express their concerns on why they feel they should receive more money. So that was just coming out of this core, um, core one. The question is how do we move forward for core two, right? How has this training prepared you for the leadership role in your school or community? These are what you're gonna share next week. We're not asking you to do this today. Based on your written testimonials that you're gonna be putting together and we're gonna ask you to share those next week. We're gonna spend a lot of time hearing you talk uh, from session three, what, remember we, we talked about in session three, what specific public action will you commit to doing? Anna, I know you're all about public funding and whether or not that's one of those things that you wanna attack, then so be it, you can choose that. Again, we ask that you do something with this training. You're gonna receive a stipend of 250. We talked about what you can do with that, those dollars on how you can do to support your cause. There is no, you know, we're not going to see you knock on your door and ask you, show me what you've done. This is a good faith agreement that we have that you are going to actually take this information, this training and do something positive with it as you move forward to make changes, not only for your child, but for the children of the city of Milwaukee. All right. So again, um, what will you commit to examples where you're going to conduct one-on-ones, be a part of a, a parent group within your school or even a larger one. If you, you've already met outside, you have your Zoom information, feel free to, to develop your own group and see how, what you can do with that. And again, I offer myself as a resource and I quote people from cohort one constantly are emailing me or texting me and asking me for their opinion on certain things. I'm always available at their, at their discretion and I'll share the same with you. I'll be available at your discretion if you need me to assist you in any way. All right, any questions? I apologize about the video. I will send that to you. It's only a real quick five minute video, but it's a very powerful one. I think you'll enjoy watching it. All right, so if uh, anyone have any questions? I actually do. Um, I know that you were saying that you, you're going to share more information on how to kind of start with parent groups or, you know, where to get started. My question is, um, are schools bound by basically like HIPAA laws, the privacy laws when it comes to their, their parents or any kind of information? Um, because that's where I'm thinking I might need to start is somehow getting some of the information I have out to other parents. Yes, that's a, I, I'm sorry for my dog. I'm barking. No Clearly, it's... my dog just heard it, so <laughs> you're good. Um, yes, you 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 will have to um, probably meet with parents outside of school. I don't think schools are going to give you their personal information because it's private privacy but you can reach out to, there's always going to be a school parent liaison. There's someone in the school that's designated as that person. 
it may even be the principal themselves in a school of a hundred something kids. It may, you know, parent principals wear a lot of hats. Let me tell you, I, I was one I know. Um, in a larger school, they may assign that to somebody else. Sandra Stogda, who's on this call, served as one of those individuals at one point at Bruce Corrupe. So you can contact your school and, and see who that person is. And they can reach out to parents for you or even give them your information and then they can contact you. That's how I would work it. But then you just can't walk into a school and say, can I have the list of all your parents? They're not gonna give you that because it's private information. As you can imagine, you wouldn't want anyone giving your information to anyone. All right, anyone else, any other questions? And to your point, yes, down the road, we will be contacting parents about uh, how we can establish a, a, a more um, permanent kind of group of parents that are going to serve in, 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 in a role of advocacy around all kind of topics, whether it be funding, whether it be school climate, whether it be, you know, um, um, report cards, things of that nature, um, enrollment, whatever the case may be, but that's coming down the road, all right? If no one else has anything, please take five minutes to fill out the session five evaluation at this moment. If you don't mind turning your videos off, so I know that you're doing that. When you're done, turn your videos back on, so I know that you're done. If you finish before the five, again, you can go on the chat and do this as well. Just combine the two. Thank you. So, does anyone have any questions? If not, look at 755. There goes the five minute video that I was going to share with you that I unfortunately didn't share. So I'm giving you a gift of five minutes. Isn't that the best gift in life is time, right? And we all the gift, gift is give me some time, you know, right? There's 24 hours in a day, but there's never enough time. So I'm, my gift to you is five minutes. So do what you do with those five minutes. God bless you all. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.